Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Tip of the Week. Um, so I had somebody ask me recently if I could do some tips on highlights and shadows. Um, I will break this up into a few different pieces uh, because the way that you deal with highlights and shadows on a frame-by-frame -frame animation is a little bit different from how you deal with them in cutout style animation. And um, there are a couple of different ways of doing highlights and shadows. So let's start with um, the most basic way on week one. We'll start out with doing a frame-by-frame -frame animation. And um, thank you to my big, big friends for allowing us to use their characters for some demo materials here. So I just brought in some demo materials that I have available to me. And uh, so it's just a frame-by-frame -frame animation. There are, you know, several different frames. It's all on one layer. Like if you look at it in the drawing view, you see the entire drawing in the drawing view. And... Um, now, what, what is useful is to be able to access the highlight and shadow. When you're doing frame-by-frame -frame animation, it's useful to be able to access the highlight and shadow kind of directly on top of this drawing. Some people will do it on a separate drawing layer, but with um, Animate Pro and Harmony, it's also possible to draw the highlight and shadow directly on there. So, for example, um, if I take the overlay layer, I could turn on uh, the preview there so that I can see the other layer through it, and then I could just go in here with a color. It doesn't really matter what color it is, but uh, do keep in mind when you are doing colors here, if you do have a semi-transparent alpha value, that will also affect the color of the final uh, of the final product there. So, um, so then now when I come in here, let's just uh, get in a little bit closer there. So. Now I can, I'm on my overlay layer and I can just draw, let's draw a simple shadow there on the, on the nose. And you do not have to be careful about making sure that it's very clean within that line because what happens is when you apply the uh, tone effect to this, it basically looks at where, uh, where your, your drawing that's plugged into the tone module, where it overlaps. And so you see, because this is on the same drawing layer, it's all tied to that drawing, but it's on a sub-layer that's different, so I can go back and erase, and it's only going to erase the pieces on that sub-layer. Uh, so that's just a couple of tricks for how to maximize your use of the uh, sub-layers there. Um, I particularly like to use the sub-layer concept when I'm working with frame-by-frame uh, -frame animation, but um, you can also make use of these definitely when you're doing the cutout style animation. So then basically what you do here is you can go to the next frame over and you can even turn on your onion skin um, to see what happened on the previous one. This is one case where it's useful to have it, you know, if you are going to use the onion skin, it's maybe useful to have the uh, highlight or shadow on a separate layer because when it's on a separate layer, you only see the onion skin of that sub-layer. Whereas here, I'm seeing the... I'm seeing the um, the whole, all of the three layers in the onion skin when I do turn on the preview mode there, but anyway, uh, you can get a sense of where it is. There's always positives and negatives to the different ways of working, obviously, like there, you know, you can you can do things in a, in a number of different ways, and uh, each way has its advantages and disadvantages. So having all of the uh, art on one layer makes it cleaner, for example, in your network view, and it means that you don't have to make sure they're both connected to the same peg. Um, but, you know, sometimes if things like onion skin are really key to you, then you might want to think about putting that on a completely separate drawing instead of on a different sub-layer of the same drawing. Uh, but in any case, um, that's generally how we do it. So now I've got a couple of frames there of, of shadows on there. I won't do the entire um, series here. Maybe I'll just do one more drawing just to really get a sense of what's going on there. So. I've kind of been putting the shadows on the um, left-hand side of my character in there and a little bit under the ears. So let's say that's good enough now. A um, couple of things. If I go in my camera view now and I just take a look at what this looks like, um, I see in my camera view, I see that overlay layer. And I don't really want to see it all the time. So... This is where you can use one of these tricks where you click on the yellow options box of the drawing that you're working on there. And if you check out your layer properties and you go over to the drawing tab, then you can choose not to see 
the overlay layer as you're working on it there. But then you could take in your module library, you can take your overlay, let's grab it in here. Let's go in the filter tab. I can take the overlay layer, uh, overlay layer, overlay layer filter, because I, I colored on the overlay. And then I could, if I want to, put that back out. Uh, because I have read overlay turned off there, I won't see it here. So what some people do, there's two ways of doing it. You could either leave it turned on there, and then here you could filter out using um, the channel selector. I think it's the channel selector, is it? Yeah, uh, not that one. It is the layer selector. Sorry, sorry. Okay. Clearly I don't use that one very often. Uh, you could use the layer selector, and you could use this one just to filter out the line art and color art. That's totally valid. So if I did that, and I slip that in there with the Alt key, and then I have all of them turned on, then you know you, you can turn off the overlay layer if it's on top and not have it show. But what I prefer to do, um, and I think what other people do generally uh, prefer to do, um, is to actually make a clone of that layer. So let's take a look at that way of doing things. So I'm just going to go back to my original drawing layer. So I've got my original drawing layer here, and all four of these are turned on. And when you do a copy-paste with a Command-C and Command-V or Control-C, Control-V in the network view, by default it makes a clone. And a clone is where the two drawings are linked together. So, in other words, if I take my drawing here and I swap out to another drawing, it swaps both of these instances together. Um, but what's interesting about this is you could use one of these instances just to show the, um, the overlay layer, and then it can go into the other instance, and you can turn off the overlay layer in that one. And then you have the two different ones there. So now, Basically, it's like having two different layers. If you did decide from the get-go to have the artwork on two different layers, you would be at this step with me now. So now that we have two different layers here to work with um, to show what's going on with the different ones, I've got the overlay of the shadow there on one layer, and then on the other layer I have the original artwork. Now I can grab my tone effect we call it tone, by the way, because we already have another effect in here that's called shadow, and the shadow effect is your drop shadow. And the tone effect is like the tone of the skin, think of it, like, like you're actually um, affecting the color of the drawing. So we grab our tone effect in there, and now I can take this and I can use the Alt uh, shortcut and slide it in there. Um, but when you think about it, you always want to put the mat in the left hand port and the original drawing in the right hand port. So um, another way of saying that is you want the thing that will be affected to go in the right hand port and you want the thing that will do the affecting to go in the left hand port. And that's the case for all of the effects. It's standardized across Harmony and Anime Pro. So whenever you have an effect that has two plugs, always the left-hand port will be the mat, the thing doing the affecting. The right-hand port will be the original drawing or the thing that will be affected by the effect. So as soon as I do that, you see a bit of a preview here in the OpenGL view of what that looks like. Um, and if you do want to see the full one, you do have to do a render. So I'll just throw a color card underneath there and then I can go here to the render view, click on that render view button, and when I do, you see the full effect in there. Now from here, um, because I had drawn multiple frames there, I think I have a few different frames. I've got like, there's my three frames. Then I see the shadow on all three frames. Um, as soon as I go to a frame where I didn't draw my shadow, of course I'm not going to see my shadow there yet. Um, so it really, it, it applies the effect for the entire drawing layer, uh, for each drawing layer that you have in here, plugged in. So there's a couple of other things that you could do with this. If I open up the options box of the shadow, this is where you can affect all of the different properties of the shadow. So the reason that this is a really great way of working is that you go through a process first in the beginning where you define where the shadow is. And after you've defined where the shadow is, 
you can define what the shadow looks like. So now, after I've drawn the shadow, I could decide that I'd like to, for example, change the color, make it a bit darker. Uh, I could change the alpha value on there because there's actually an, an alpha value that's um, de deciding how transparent the shadow is on top of that. I could uh, really change the color entirely like if you're outside it might be a bit more of a blue shadow whereas if you're inside by the fire it's going to be more of an, a warmer shadow like, a, like an orange or a red shadow uh, maybe even a little bit yellow um, and so what's interesting about this as well is that if you look at um, all of the we, all of these are functions they're all tied to functions here and whenever you see a button like this next to one of these properties in here that button means that you can animate that property over time. So for example, if you have something like a, you know, a character that is standing in front of a fireplace that's flickering, then you can draw the shadow just normally straight first. And then after you've drawn it, you can go in there and um, attach functions to each of these just by clicking on it once. And then you can add keyframes. So you know, like you could affect the fact that it's going to be one color on one frame. And, you know, if you take a look in your timeline at the bottom, if you click on the plus sign, it shows you all the functions. And this is my favorite thing down here. Really, I love this thing right here, data view. Uh, I don't think a lot of people know about the data view. What's nice about the data view is the data view gives you detailed information about the properties of all those effects. So um, as I'm dragging on that color there, you see it's adjusting the values inside. So I could go and, and make it really dark on one frame, for example, and I could go a few frames later and I could change something. And by default, because I have my animate button turned on, when I change that property there, do you see that it's, it's actually created a keyframe automatically? And I could go in there and change something else and poof it creates all those keyframes but having the data view open allows you to go in there and see all of the information if you do want to as well you can um, you know double click on any one of these effects and that opens up the Bezier editor the, and the Bezier editor is how you edit the function so you could go in there and adjust oops let me select that keyframe you could adjust the value of the keyframe you could adjust the Bezier between the, the two keyframes to affect how it moves from one keyframe to the other. And, um, and then have more detailed control over what's happening between the two. And if you think about it, the reason why this is so powerful is, let's go back to that example of the flickering fireplace. What happens if you don't do it this way? Um, if you were instead to actually go in and paint the shadow, then, if you've got to go back and, like, you paint the whole shadow in, and then you play it back, and it doesn't look good, then you have to go back and repaint the entire shadow. Whereas here, if you're controlling separately where the shadow is from how it looks, you, you just paint once. You paint the first time to define where the shadow is. And then, uh, because you're using these effects here to adjust the flicker on the shadow, if you play back and the flicker doesn't look good, then you can just go back and adjust your functions. And trust me, adjusting functions is way faster than repainting things. So that's what I wanted to do for this week. That is the first tip there, so how to go ahead and use the tone module. If you are, um, just to finish this up really quickly, if you are going to do both a highlight and a tone, let's just grab a highlight in here. There we go. So if you are going to do both a highlight and a tone, then you want to slip your highlight in after the tone or vice versa. So in other words, you need to have the output of one of the effects going into the right hand side of the other. So now if I want to, just for the sake of argument, um, I'll add a new drawing layer for this. You could also do it the same way I did it before with the overlay. Instead, instead maybe you use the underlay or one of the other sub layers. But in this case, just to show the other side of things, you could create a new drawing layer 
and on this drawing layer now you can go in and define where the highlight's going to be. Um, and yeah, sorry that looks really not very nice, but now if I take that drawing and I plug it into the left side of the highlight, you see how the highlight is appearing on top of where I put the highlight, and the shadow is also applied where the shadow is. And um, if we look at the properties in here, it's the same kind of thing as the properties on the other one. So you can go back there and adjust certain things. And just to point out one other one that's really useful is the radius. The radius applies how sharp you want that edge to be. If it's down at zero, it's very sharp. Whereas if it's quite high, then it's very blurry. And some things like, you know, like Princess and the Frog would have a very blurry shadow. And some things like the way that they do a lot of cutout for TV will have a very sharp edge. It really just, it all depends on the style that you're going for. So let's leave it there for this week. So that is highlights and shadows on a frame by frame animation sequence. And I'm going to pick it up next week um, and talk a little bit about um, another way of doing shadows and highlights and taking that other way and this way as well but taking both of those ways and applying those also to a cutout character. And I'll give you a couple of different ways that you can do it with a cutout character. So um, have a good week, and I'll see you next time.